Greetings, everyone. It is wonderful to see you, and welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. And those of you who have been here before know that the National Constitution Center is the only institution in America <laughs> chartered by Congress, here you can recite it along with me, to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. <laughs> Beautiful, absolutely lovely. And this is such an exciting month for the National Constitution Center. It will culminate on October 27th with our opening of a new gallery displaying one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. This is the first time since 1789 that an original copy of the Bill of Rights has been displayed in Philadelphia. It will be shown in a magnificent new gallery that will include rare copies of the Declaration of Independence and the first public printing of the Constitution, making us the only institution aside from the National Archives, I think, to have three copies of these rare documents of freedom in one place. It'll also include an exciting new interactive which you can use online that will allow you to click on any provision of the Bill of Rights and trace the spread of that liberty across the globe. So you can see the Japanese Constitution adopting the American Fourth Amendment and European constitutions adopting the First Amendment and when and where. And until that opening, we just have a blockbuster series of Bill of Rights related events, including tomorrow night, the third in our series of constitutional debates with our great partners at Intelligence Squared. And we will debate whether the warrantless collection of telephone metadata violates the Fourth Amendment. That will be a great thrill uh, here tomorrow night. Um, we have some superb authors coming up, including uh, Edward Larson on George Washington next Monday at noon. And then on uh, October 20th, we have our first partnership with the Ford Presidential Library. And uh, Professor Gerhardt uh, has helped us curate a conference on the constitutional legacy of President Ford that will take place in Grand Rapids. And then we'll all come back here on October 21st for the Liberty Medal, which will be awarded to Malala. So it is just gonna be an amazing October. Ladies and gentlemen, this book is spectacular. <laughs> I, I just was so excited to read it. Um, this book on the forgotten presidents because what Michael Gerhardt has done is take a topic which seems like a parlor game, these, these obscure presidents who we don't remember well, and revealed that the Constitution was at the center both of their failures, their, 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 their devotion to a particular constitutional vision of executive and legislative power, but also that their failures laid the groundwork for the success of more powerful presidents. So this is a constitution-saturated book. It is so on mission, it is so fresh, it teaches us so much, and I cannot wait to discuss it. Let me introduce my friend uh, Michael Gerhardt um, and uh, remind you to turn off your cell phones and to <laughs> write your questions on the cards that we will pass along, uh, which we will take uh, a little bit into the conversation. Michael Gerhardt is the Samuel Ash Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Law and Director of the University of North Carolina Center on Law and Government. He's the author of five books, including The Power of Precedent. That's another wonderful book where Michael really showed us how uh, judicial precedents are as central a interpretive methodology for the Supreme Court as the more familiar methods, including text and original understanding. The Financial Times has named The Forgotten Presidents as one of the best books of 2013, as it undoubtedly is. Uh, Michael has advised congressional and White House officials on many constitutional issues, including judicial nominations, impeachment, and the filibuster. He's participated in no fewer than five Supreme Court confirmation hearings and was the only joint witness in the House Judiciary Committee's historic hearing on the background and history of impeachment. Uh, in conjunction with this consideration of the impeachment of President Clinton. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Michael Gerhardt. Thank you. Thank it's such an honor to welcome you to the Constitution Center, Michael, and let's begin by asking why you decided to write this book. Well, that's a great question. Let me just say at the outset, uh, I really appreciate the chance to be here. And it, uh, as Jeff would know, as a fellow constitutional law professor, this is Mecca for us. I mean, this is the greatest place to be. And I'm sort of in awe of this place. Um, I'm moving my office here later today. Please um, do. Well, you're an honorary <laughs> fellow in every way. This is, uh, no. Um, this is it's something that uh, obviously uh, isn't, it comes close to our hearts. Uh, 
So, you know, why this book? Um, as you well know, and as you were just talking about, a lot of what I've done over the years is um, not just write books, which has been important in doing research on constitutional law, but I've also uh, taken very seriously an opportunity to consult with uh, particularly congressional leaders. Um, and in the course of that consulting work, and um, I've encountered a lot of questions of constitutional law. And one of the things I kept encountering as I looked at things like uh, the conflicts between presidents and Congress is how much of that work, uh, number one, doesn't involve courts, but number two, how much of it turns on history people don't know. Uh, and a lot of what I ended up working on oftentimes were things like who made the most recess appointments in the 19th century, a fairly interesting and significant question sometimes. Um, and it turns out nobody knows the answer to that question <laughs> uh, until now. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to bring all that work together and look at it uh, from the perspective of um, to what it teaches us about the Constitution and the presidency. Now, we do have a strong anti-cell phone rule. And remember, it's all being monitored by the NSA. And we will debate it tomorrow <laughs> unless you turn <laughs> off your cell phones. Please, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, OK, that's a very good reason to write this book. And as you say, what you learned is tremendously useful. The debate over President Obama's use of the recess appointment power is now informed by some of the history that you've uncovered here. You also uh, have a great uh, taxonomy for how to identify a forgotten president. So what does it take to be a forgotten president? <laughs> what does it take to we be a forgotten take president? Take a poll of this room and see who yes, <laughs> Exactly. Um, that was actually a poll at my dinner table to see who remembered what. Uh, my kids are small, so that every president's forgotten for them. Um, uh, <laughs> or unknown, maybe more accurate. Um, but you did say your son was quizzing you on Truman, yes, Truman's yes, vice president. Yes, so my, my son Noah um, would like to quiz me on trivia about presidents. That's how I got trained to do the book. Um, so uh, the, I had to think a lot of different ways. How do you measure what's a forgotten president? Um, and, there, and so in the course of trying to figure out that question, I went through a lot of different possibilities. And I ended up uh, seizing on a few. Um, one of them was. Uh, for example, looking at the history books that are used in middle school and high school. Uh, it turns out North Carolina State has a wonderful library there with all the books used in schools. Um, and so we went and read every line of every history book and coded them to figure out which presidents were mentioned the least. Um, so we even have a chart on the back as to who comes out at the bottom of that. Um, and then we also looked at major research libraries. Um, what books do they carry? What books don't they carry? Um, and again, determine who's at the bottom and who's at the top. And we came up with a, a ranking of presidents, basically. Uh, who's the most remembered? And I'll ask you that in a second. And who's the least remembered? Um, hmm. And it's pretty clear. And each makes sense. Yeah. We had an amazing discussion just last week with Jeffrey Ward, the co-author of this spectacular FDR um, series and the author of my favorite presidential biographies of remembered presidents. Is he the most remembered president? He's close. It turns out it's Lincoln. Um, but, of course, Roosevelt is way near the top, and maybe after this wonderful documentary, <laughs> he'll be back on top. Um, so it's usually Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Washington uh, are the top three, um, to some extent in that order, although Washington might end up being second. Great. Well, we have 13 presidents with the distinction of being forgotten, although one appears twice, and that is Grover Cleveland, who was forgotten for separate reasons in each of his two, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> two terms. That's right. Uh, Doubly forgotten. Doubly forgotten. Um, and uh, I'd like to just go through them, because they have such powerful constitutional legacies in turn. Thanks. So let's begin with Martin Van Buren. Yes. And he had a rather distinctive constitutional vision, which was associated with the Jacksonian party. And it was in sharp distinction to the Whig constitutional vision. Um, tell us what the Jacksonian and Whig constitutional visions right. were. So I, I'm going to try and keep you as awake, awake, as awake as possible as I do this. Uh, no, it's so, interesting. It's no, it, interesting. Uh, and and I, as you listen to this, it may be useful to think about how it may resonate with how we approach the Constitution today. So for the Jacksonians, I think there were a couple of things that were very central. One was the idea of the president being the only elected official in our entire system of government who's actually elected by all the people of the United States. So if you think of one person being representative of all the people, Jackson's approach was to say it's going to be the president. And I think most, if not all, every president thinks that way today. Um, in addition to that, Jacksonians believe very strongly in small d democracy, though of course they were also big d Democrats. Um, but they brought into the, 
a government the idea that the people should rule, the people should have a critical say about how government is run. So those are central to the Jacksonians. Um, the Whigs were formed in part because they hated the Jacksonians. Um, that should seem familiar to you, all of you. Um, and they especially hated Jackson. Um, but they also felt that much of what I just said to you was completely false, uh, or at least was not being candid. So they thought Jackson was a dictator. They thought Jackson was a tyrant. The idea that the president could be that powerful and that uniquely in, in, in uh, attempt to consolidate a lot of power to himself and claim some authority over the other branches, they all thought that was wrong. They thought it was corrupting, and they opposed that. Um, the second thing they opposed was the idea of factions, so they didn't like the idea that somehow the Jacksonians could represent factions. And lastly, I guess an additional reason, is that they simply felt um, they, wanted, they formed themselves in part because they wanted to become a platform for Henry Clay. So he could then use that to defeat Jackson and become president. So there was some self-interest, of course, as well. Great. So tell us why Jackson failed in defending, or rather why Van Buren failed in, in defending the Jacksonian view of executive power and in fighting congressional oversight. So Van Buren comes into office, of course, right after Jackson. He had been Jackson's vice president in Jackson's second term. So you can think of Van Buren as Jackson's third term. Um, the problem mostly was he wasn't Jackson. <laughs> so um, he couldn't bring to the job all the different skills and, and really sort of powerful personality um, that, that Jackson had. So Van Buren came into office with the objective of trying to extend what Jackson had done. And that would include a strong presidency. It would also include sort of trying to force his will upon Congress. Um, and each of those things was very difficult because people generally disliked Van Buren. They thought of him as a shady, somewhat corrupt character. He didn't have the forceful personality of, of uh, Jackson. But through much of his life, he actually was called the, the Red Fox. He had red hair and he was supposed to be very crafty, so they called him the Red Fox because they couldn't pin him down on what he thought and believed. So as president, suddenly he found himself having to believe things, having to take strong stands. And for Van Buren, that wasn't easy. He couldn't marshal a lot of support to do it, so the ultimate, ultimately what happens is he gets his preferred legislation through Congress. It's not very effective. He's trying to solve the nation's first depression. Pretty big problem. Um, and he's doing it on the basis of the Jacksonian sort of philosophy, is that, which was Essentially, the federal government didn't have much power to do this. So, at the, so that's a quandary to be in. You've got a massive depression. You don't think you can do much at the federal level. So what they did is essentially pass a law that involved um, the creation of what was called an independent treasury. It's not the same thing as we've got today. Um, and it didn't do much to uh, relieve the depression. And therefore, he got voted out of office because he, did, he had backed some failed policies. So it's a not a modern view of executive power. The Jacksonians and Van Buren believe in a strong presidency, but not a strong federal government. Right. And the Whigs believe in a powerful Congress, right. but also a constrained Congress as well. Right. And also, they believed in a weak president. So in a sense, they were very much the inverses of each other. So uh, the Whigs would have preferred a very strong Congress, policy coming from Congress, and they would have preferred the president simply to do what Congress wanted. Um, that's not going to work out either. Um, but with Van Buren, you've got somebody who turns out to, be, to believe in a very modest role for dealing with uh, financial matters. Uh, and to some extent, there are still folks that believe that, um, probably less than the Democratic Party, though. Uh, but that was the case in the 19th century. Uh, and with Van Buren, um, he ended up not being very innovative either. Uh, because he was, in those days, the conservatives would have been the Van Buren crowd. Um, just every solution for them was a very modest and small one. And when you're dealing with a depression, that's a hard road to take. One theme that comes powerfully in your book is that the more constitutionally minded the presidents, often the less politically effective they were. And you have, you quote Van Buren saying, the principle that will govern me in the high duty to which my country calls is strict adherence to the letter and spirit of the Constitution as it was designed by those who framed it. To what degree was he an originalist and to what degree did that contribute to his failure? Well, I think it contributes to some extent. So he, d he certainly believed that the, the um, what you of course just read, he believed that the federal government uh, had very limited powers. And it's interesting, one of the patterns I, I found doing the book 
which at least interested me a great deal, was how many historians dismiss these presidents as weak and ineffective. I don't think I see them that way. Actually, oftentimes I found them stronger and somewhat effective, but mostly what I found is they would take fairly strong stands at political risk. So here's Van Buren taking a fairly strong stand. Look, we've got limited federal power to deal with this. And then having to deal with the political consequences of that. Had he been much, let's say, craftier, or had he been much more small p political, he might have just figured, let's figure out a way that would appease everybody politically, put that through, and maybe that'll work and maybe not. No, he was willing to take the heat for doing something uh, because of a constitutional principle, which is, I don't believe in federal power very much here. And therefore, when this federal problem persisted, the depression, he was going to be the person blamed for it, and, and he took the blame. Great. Okay, our next failed president is William Henry Harrison. Not a surprise since he lasted how, a month? How long? 31 was it? days. 31 <laughs> days. Okay, well, he had a limited opportunity for right. tremendous success. But you say, nevertheless, in those 31 days, he contributed something important, which was a growing resistance to the Whig notion of congressional supremacy yes. and an understanding that the president actually had to take an independent stand. Tell us about that yes. achievement. Well, maybe one thing everybody can think about as we go through this discussion is who's the least remembered president. So at the end, we'll reveal the, uh, who it is. Um, and a great and strong candidate for that is William Henry Harrison, you know, having been president for 31 days. He was the first candidate uh, nominated for president by, uh, first successful candidate nominated, nominated by the Whigs. Um, and he wins the presidency, uh, and therefore he's the first Whig president. Uh, this, the expectation is, from Henry Clay and others, that uh, Harrison would be very weak president. That is to say, somebody who would do the bidding of the Whig party. If Congress wanted something, he would do it. If Henry Clay wanted something, Harrison would do it. And so what you see at, from the day Harrison's elected to the day of his inauguration is almost like a, uh, it's almost like a comical sort of escapade where, ch uh, where Clay is chasing Harrison around the country trying to nail him down on certain appointments and certain policies. And Harrison's resisting that, which is an interesting response from somebody who's supposed to be a Whig president listening to a leader of Congress who was Henry Clay. Uh, and when they do talk, Harrison resists saying to Clay, oh, I'll do what you want. So by the time Harrison is inaugurated, though he dies very shortly thereafter, um, he's barely speaking to Clay. Two weeks into his presidency, Clay leaves town. They're so alienated. Um, now that's, again, a very odd thing to expect from somebody who's a Whig president and a Whig the Whig leader in Congress is Clay. They weren't talking to each other. Harrison was beginning to realize that the weak presidency was not going to work so much. He wasn't, in fact, at one point he even says to Clay, look, I'm the president. You go to your, you go to your end of the Pennsylvania Avenue and we'll keep it that way. Um, Clay wasn't happy about that. He's a lar large character. Well, yeah. didn't his grandson had a similar moment right. where he, when the cabinet tried to impose a choice on him, stood up and said, I'm the president. Right. And so, there, so both uh, William Henry Harrison and Benjamin Harrison, they're both in the book and they're both forgotten. Um, but both came into office thinking they'd be weak, well, come, came into office from parties that wanted weak presidents. But they took a principled stand, which was, at least at the time, being strong and strongly resisting congressional pressure strongly resisting being told what to do, basically, and saying, no, I'm going to protect the prerogatives of this office. For William Henry Harrison, that meant I will determine my appointments, not Congress. It also meant he would determine when to call a special session of Congress on the Depression and when not. Those were big issues in those days. And Harrison wanted to take the lead on them, which cut right at the heart of the Whig philosophy, which was to defer to Congress. Was the debate between the Jacksonian and the Whigs on constitutional issues similar to that between the Tea Party and mainstream Republican and Democrats today? To some extent. I mean, you don't want to overstate the similarity, but I think to some extent, I mean, especially if you're, what you're talking about is trying to go back to first principles. So if your first principles are, for example, at least for some uh, Tea Party folks, maybe, well, let's go back to really, really limited federal government. That may mean no Department of Education. All, let's limit what we can do under the Commerce Clause and sort of draw back, to, or draw back a, a, a good deal. That's, to some extent, where um, you would find Van Buren. Yeah. But the, the strong conclusion of this book is that presidents who embrace that limited view of, uh, of, of presidential and ultimately federal power 
failed? Well, they fail, uh, but it's, again, not for, it's not for a lack of principle. It's actually going to be, I think, at least the book suggests, they're failing because of a principle they're trying to defend. It's just not a popular principle. Um, and it turns out uh, sometimes the principle doesn't, doesn't produce policy that's either effective or, again, popular. So the people want an energetic executive. That seems to be a theme that we run into time and time again, um, which is, well, people want to get, see things get done. Uh, so if, there, if there's a problem, they want to see it get solved. Uh, and sometimes they want the president to be part of that. Uh, and so one thing that these presidents have in common is they either don't solve the problems or they defend some principles which turn out to be not popular either, either within their party or within the more general electorate. Great. Uh, let's turn now to uh, Tyler, uh, to uh, John Tyler, most famous, as you said, for resolving the question of whether the vice president becomes president on the death of the president. And there was a dispute, as you note, over whether uh, the, the phrase of the Constitution that says that in the case of removal of the president from office or of his death, the same shall devolve on the vice president. And the question is whether the same refers to the office, the president's power and duties. Right. How was that resolved in the case of Tyler? Well, Tyler stood his ground. So Ty, Ty, Tyler's not even in Washington when Harrison dies. That's how fast that happens. I mean, Harrison basically gets sick on the day of his inauguration, and he goes downhill from there, which, by the way, is also rather interesting because you're, everything we said about Harrison, you have to think about the fact he's dying as this is going on. So he's taking these rather strong stands at the same time his health is deteriorating. He dies. Tyler's at home. Tyler figures, I better get to Washington. Um, he, he figures out on the way. He's actually a good lawyer uh, out of William and Mary, which in those days produced some other good lawyers like John Marshall. Um, and by the time he gets to Washington, he's got a plan. His plan is, I'm going to take the oath of office and become the President of the United States. Now, we'd all listen to that and think, yeah, that makes sense. Um, very few people he's encountering when he gets there think that way. His entire cabinet says to him, it's actually Harrison's cabinet, cabinet says to him, you're not the president. You're the acting president, or you're the vice president acting as president, but you're not the president. And Tyler basically says, and he's got almost a speech he reads to the cabinet, but he basically says to, to them, no, I'm the president, and if you don't like that, you can leave. Um, they have this stare down. Uh, Tyler prevails, but not lo long thereafter, his entire cabinet, except for one, resigns in protest um, because they don't like the fact that he's actually trying to be president. Not only takes the oath, then he tries to be president. And you know, he has... The next four, over the next four years, he has some of the most active presidency of anybody in history. He's encountering resistance everywhere he turns. So his, his presidency is constitutionally quite rich. I, uh, he's the first president, for example, where there's a formal attempt to impeach him. Uh, they try to get information from the House tries to get information from him on appointments and other things. So he writes these seminal documents resisting all these different things Congress is doing to push against him. And by the way, I should mention at this point, he's supposed to be a Whig, and he's resisting Congress at every turn. So now you have two presidents in a row who are supposed to be Whigs, neither, neither of whom was very popular with the Whigs. Tyler began his presidency as a friend of Henry Clay's. You know where this is going. By the end, <laughs> by the end of it, Clay doesn't like him either. Um, so the Whigs are getting very fed up with all these people supposed to be their person not becoming their person, but instead taking really strong stance, oftentimes, to consolidate presidential power. Now, Tyler, as you say, fought more with Congress than any previous president, more vetoes than anyone else except for Jackson, more nominees rejected. Yes. Was the core of the debate his strict constructionism and his notion that state sovereignty is the default rule of all constitutional interpretation? I think it was a big part of it. I don't think it was all of it. I mean, so part of it was his, his philosophy, and I think you'd be right to think, okay, here it may be not just philosophy, but it's also something else. I mean, uh, here it's the fact that he's not really elected in his own right. And Tyler, um, we should have said, or I should have said, when he becomes Harrison's vice president, had to leave his political party to do that. He had been a big D Democrat. Um, he becomes Harrison's vice president, then he becomes president. Whigs are thinking, okay, well, maybe he's one of us, but we don't really trust him. That was actually quite accurate. Um, they end up not liking him either. So he ends up alienating both parties. So some of what's going on here, especially within the Senate, is they're not happy. Tyler's not doing what they want, not giving them the patronage they'd want. Um, 
and he's trying to protect presidential prerogative to name the folks he'd prefer. Actually, the people he's naming are not hacks at all. They're perfectly reputable, oftentimes really excellent people. They're getting rejected all the time. He makes uh, nine nominations to the Supreme Court to fill two slots. He gets only one of them confirmed. Um, and all those nominees, by most, everybody's account, are quite well qualified. So it's very much a power struggle. And he's losing it in one respect, but he's also winning it in another. He's losing it in the sense that nominees are getting defeated. He's winning it in the sense that other presidents are watching. And other presidents are realizing he's defending our prerogatives, and they're going to appreciate that. Um, we learned from this book that fractious Supreme Court battles are nothing new. Right. <laughs> right. And the idea of polarization seems mild when you see the, the, the right. venomous uh, difficulty these guys had, had getting their nominees through. Right, and that, especially with Tyler. I mean, Tyler is, um, so again, Tyler has all these perfectly able, qualified nominees who are being rejected. And what you see is that, particularly in the 19th century, uh, the Senate is not shy about rejecting people or shy about simply not having a hearing or a vote on somebody. Uh, and Tyler, and this is going to ultimately culminate later with uh, Zachary Taylor, uh, who tries to create an innovation there called recess appointments. Um, and, and it's creating more and more friction between Congress and the president as things goes on, go on. Another th pattern I think it's worth talking about is um, that even if a president fails, it's important to understand how that affects the balance of power between Congress and the president. So if Tyler's doing something and Congress is resisting, you can see that as an effort on Congress's part to retain its authority, to remain strong in its own right. So even if there's a president who's ineffective, that could actually work to Congress's benefit. So throughout the 19th century, Congress is actually strengthening itself in opposition to the presidency. Uh, and you give plenty of examples of cases where presidents litigate a position only to have their power weakened when they're rebuffed. Right. And this happened, by the way, with Van, Van Buren, uh, with the famous Amistad case, where with Van Buren, we won't go through that movie here, uh, um, but that's one of the early slave cases that comes before the Supreme Court. But uh, Van Buren's trying to use that, that situation involving the Amistad and some slaves that had rebelled on a ship and to have them sent back essentially to Cuba and ultimately uh, maybe elsewhere. Um, but what Van Buren's trying to do at the same time is he's trying to game the system and he loses every, at every level of that situation and he's ultimately forced to abide by what the judges say and he does. That's pretty remarkable in itself. So the president does, at the end, Van Buren doesn't say, I'm just gonna reject what the court says. No, at the end he says, I guess if the courts say that, I've gotta abide by it. That's an interesting precedent in itself, and other presidents are going to end up following it. You say in the introduction that some of these forgotten presidents very much influence the constitutional viewpoint of our greatest presidents, and you kind of give a pop quiz. You say, who do you think most influenced Lincoln? If you know who it is, you say, read no further. Right. Uh, and the answer, <laughs> uh, should, should we, uh, any, any guesses? We heard about Buchanan. Buchanan. No. Excellent, Zachary Taylor. Yes. Very good. Uh, you get a. F oh, that's fine. Okay. Well, wherever we get our information is fine. I think you get a free president's tie from the gift shop. Although, although Michael's tie has all the presidents, so we're going to have a version that blots out the remembered president. So it's only the forgotten and presidents. He's going to take credit for that. I no, say. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Okay, so why was it that Zachary Taylor so influenced Lincoln's constitutional? Well, view? Zachary Taylor ended up influencing Lincoln in a couple different respects. So one, we have to remember that Lincoln began his political career as a Whig. And Lincoln had a total of two years in Congress. Um, that's his experience with the federal government uh, before he becomes president. Um, but those two years turn out to be pretty central or critical because for one thing, they're gonna coincide later a little bit with Taylor. Um, and when Taylor dies, uh, Lincoln's gonna give the eulogy. Uh, Lincoln really revered Taylor first as a general. Uh, he'd been a successful general in, in Mexico. Uh, and one of the things that Lincoln really loved about Lincoln is, uh, Lincoln loved about Taylor's general was he would always be able to figure out a way to win against the odds. Um, and this is something you might want to think about is for Lincoln later. He's, he loved the idea that somehow Taylor was always able to figure out a way to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. He loved his way to, imp he loves his, his ability to improvise, his ability to sort of be behind enemy lines sometimes and figure out a way to prevail. 
So he talks about that in the eulogy. Um, and then later, um, right when Lincoln is about to become president, he writes a letter um, to some supporters basically saying to them, well, if I've got anybody to credit for my political education at all, it's going to be Zachary Taylor. And it's partly because when Taylor was president, he ended up not doing political parties bidding. He ended up again trying to be his own man. Um, he created the idea of triangulation, the idea of sort of, I'm not going to be president of the, my party, I'm not going to do what Congress wants, and he somehow creates this sort of triangle where T Taylor's really trying to sort of be president in his own right and to demand what, dictate to Congress what it does. Lincoln liked that. Lincoln actually thought that was a good thing. And lastly, the policy, um, Taylor had only one policy of president. It's kind of remarkable. He was president for 15 months. He had literally only one policy. Um, but it was a critical policy. It was he wanted two, two anti-slavery territories admitted to the Union. One was New Mexico. The other was California. And so he came into office and he said, here's what I demand. Admit these as states, one after the other. Um, Congress didn't want to do that because it would have tipped the balance of power in the favor of anti-slavery forces. Congress at that point was perfectly balanced between the two. And Taylor would have been happy to tip that balance. He demanded it be tipped. Congress said no. And Lincoln had to then respond by being innovative. Lincoln loved all that. I think he really took a lot of uh, lessons from that. And you say Lincoln was also influenced by Taylor's views on recess appointments. Right. And so then what happens is um, after Congress resists what Taylor wants, and the Senate doesn't act on any of his nominations. Does that sound familiar? Um, uh, what then happens is Taylor then turns to his attorney general and says, let's think about recess appointments. And they do. They issue an opinion. On he has his attorney general issue an opinion on recess appointments, taking a very aggressive stance. He actually makes over 400 of them. Um, and that's a record, of course, at the time. A pretty much a record almost for all time. Um, and Lincoln sees that as a good thing. His attorney general is going to sign off on the very same philosophy. Um, and it's, it's a very robust view, which the Supreme Court has largely um, confirmed. And that is that anything can count as a recess. Uh, any break in Congress will count as a recess. And a president can use that time to make an appointment. It doesn't work for President Obama, because the court's going to say that turns out not to have been a break. But otherwise, if there is a break, a president can use it to make a recess appointment. And that's, that viewpoint really gets its, most, gets its fullest articulation from Taylor in the 19th century. It was fascinating to see how deep the conflict over recess appointments stretches into 19th century history. Mm -hmm. Is the recent Supreme Court decision faithful to that history? I think it is, yes. Uh, I, except for the fact that it's a judicial intervention. Um, so throughout the 19th century, of course, the court was peripheral to this. The court wasn't a player. People didn't take their disputes oftentimes to the court. Sometimes they did, but not often. There's one, uh, someone called out uh, as the greatest influence on Lincoln, Buchanan. And that was the greatest uh, surprise that he did not appear in your book. We uh, at the National Constitution Center recently ran a blog post claiming that Buchanan was the worst president of all time. Right. <laughs> and were subject to a denial of service attack by inflamed pro-Buchananites. Basically, there are some very enthusiastic Buchanan partisans who attacked us and shut down our website in outrage wow. against this libelous claim. Why was Buchanan not well, in I'm on your side. Of the <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be, then be denied right, the service right. as well. Oh, well, I'm going to shut this program down. Yeah, right absolutely. Um, well, I, I think one reason why Buchanan is not forgotten is that very thing. That is to say, um, there, there, are people, there are many people actually that do remember him by virtue of his being the worst president. So that's one, I mean, being, this book is not about evaluating good or bad. Yes. Um, it's simply about sort of evaluating impact, um, good or bad, um, or at least identifying that impact. Uh, for Buchanan, there are a lot of people that think he was bad. A lot of those people, by the way, voted for Lincoln, um, and Lincoln became president. So I think Buchanan's not forgotten for a couple reasons. One is, I think just for historians looking back over the span of time, he stands out as being really bad in office. But the other is that Lincoln's presidency is defined by what Buchanan did. So much of what Lincoln had to do early on was defined by Buchanan. So if you're going to tell the story of Lincoln, you're always going to talk about James Buchanan. OK. Um, however you can get ink, basically, uh, is, is uh, worthwhile. Right. 
Um, Fillmore destroyed the Whigs, signed the <laughs> Fugitive Slave Act, uh, and although Lincoln relied on his actions to oppose secession. It, basically, his problem was signing the Compromise of 1850, which included these five really bad provisions? That's correct. So Fillmore had been Taylor's vice president. Um, so one thing Taylor did do as the Whig president, as a, a Whig president, is he put Mr. Whig, who then was Millard Fillmore, as his vice president. This made Clay really happy. Um, <laughs> And then Clay died. Um, uh, Clay died actually right after Fillmore got in, it became president. And so when Taylor died, Clay, even though he was dying himself, was really happy. And he loved the fact that Fillmore was a Whig, is an old friend of his, founder of the Whig party. Um, and so Clay's last days in some respects were not so bad because he thought, okay, finally we've got a really genuine Whig. The only problem is what happens next. Um, so, uh, we, as you say, uh, Fillmore then signs a very controversial piece of legislation into law. Um, Taylor would have refused, and in, it's called the Compromise of 1850. It included the Fugitive Slave Act. Very controversial law. One thing it required was states that became, ended up housing fugitive slaves had to take a role in returning them to their masters. And there were nine states in the Northeast that said they weren't going to do it. They refused to comply with that federal law. Does any of this sound familiar? Um, so, and they, some of them even threatened to secede. Uh, so Fillmore and his Secretary of State was a very, very able lawyer named Daniel Webster. Um, and that what they started doing was putting together an argument for why every state in the country, everybody else for that matter, would have to comply with federal law. Doesn't matter whether you agree with it or disagree with it. Federal law applies everywhere, and it applies everywhere the same. So it applies in the South, it applies in the North, and northern states would then have to comply with federal law. If they don't, it's called treason. Um, and the other problem is they don't have the authority to secede. Well, what Fillmore just did was he just mapped out the basic philosophy that Lincoln's going to take into office later. When Lincoln comes into office, southern states are trying to secede. Lincoln's thinking, wait a minute now, this is just like what Fillmore said. And what Webster argued, we're going to use the same logic now to say you can't secede. And the other thing is, if it's federal law, people have to comply with it everywhere. So this is pretty much becomes the framework for Lincoln and, it, and his presidency. So the, I remember vigorous uh, debates with my dear friend and teacher, Akhil Amar, during the first weeks of law school. And Akhil said, really, secession was unconstitutional at the time of the framing because John Wilson said we the... James Wilson said, we the people of the United States, not we the people of each of the several states were sovereign. Your history suggests the story was more complicated, in fact. Well, I, I, I think Akhil's going to agree with this. I'm, I'm pretty confident he does because we've talked about it. <laughs> um, but I, I think that the story is more complicated when you come out the same place. Um, so there is this concept that we are sort of a United States and it's indivisible. Um, and that uh, it's, not, it's not a contract that people can come and go from or leave if you just pay enough damages or whatever else. Um, and I think that that's basically the theory that Fillmore's trying to put forward, which is it's, it's not, it's, the states here are just almost like agents of the people. And it's really about the United States and the people that are all together or formed together the United States. Um, and, that, and so we shouldn't read too much into the word states there much more into the idea that we're a union, um, and that union can't be threatened by people who, are, um, who want to see it destroyed. Now, that was a vision rejected by our next uh, uh, culprit, Franklin Pierce, who you say <laughs> many people dismiss as one of America's most inept presidents. When his wife, Jane, was told her husband was the Democratic nominee for president, she fainted. <laughs> <laughs> And she worried that he'd start drinking again. And he did. He did, in fact. <laughs> uh, and his problem, oh, and, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, Pierce's college friend, told Pierce after he won, I pity you. Indeed, I do, from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Pierce's problem was that he was too much of a strict constructionist. And he didn't quite endorse nullification and secession, but he certainly took states' rights to their logical conclusion. He did. I mean, Pierce was bad. So I suppose James McC Buchanan can take some solace in the fact that Pierce may actually have been a worse president than, than Buchanan. Um, so you might argue that would make him memorable. Uh, and we'll come, there are different reasons why I think Pierce gets forgotten. Um, but Pierce was somebody who I think was uh, uh, kind of backed into the presidency. Uh, 
He'd, not, he'd been a lackluster member of Congress, uh, left Congress really because of his drinking problem. And then what happens is um, he gets drafted in, in a sense to become president because he's a very good looking guy and he's what they call a doe face, which was somebody from the North who would support slavery. Uh, so Pierce figures, okay, I'm nominated to be president, I win the presidency, what the heck, I'll become president. Um, his wife obviously is not happy about it. She's gonna become incredible, he, she's gonna be, de, she'll be destroyed uh, shortly. And Pierce too will be almost destroyed. Uh, because on their way to Washington uh, for his inauguration, their train derails. And the worst thing that could possibly ever happen to a parent is gonna happen. They have one son, his name is Benji, and they're gonna literally see him killed in front of their eyes in this accident. Uh, Jane never ever recovers. She barely speaks to him after that. She blames the death on uh, Pierce himself. She keeps to herself in the White House, is up there praying all the time. Pierce is virtually destroyed. If you read his inaugural address, you'll see in the first line or two, he references this great uh, challenge and turmoil. Um, and then Pierce proceeds as president to try and find God, and he oftentimes spends Sunday in church. And one time he doesn't, turns out to be quite fatal. Um, and he then tries to sort of find his own way as president. His best friend is his Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis. And together, they fashion a strict construction view of the Constitution, which is that the federal government does have power, um, but its power ought to be used to support slavery. And it ought to be used to support the things that states or territories are doing that support slavery. And that's what gets him into, uh, into a problem, and it really focuses on Kansas. We can talk about that if you like. Yeah. Um, uh, a beat on Kansas and bloody Kansas and why he really messed things up there. All right, so Kansas ends up becoming the focus of a lot of activity because Kansas is one of those territories that's about to become a state, and as it's about to become a state, then suddenly slavery and anti-slavery anti -slavery and pro-slavery forces are fighting for its soul. They're trying to take it over. And what happens is the, uh, the pro-slavery forces get control of part of the state, and Pierce decides to back them and not the others. So he uses all the power of the federal government to back the pro-slavery forces in Kansas to take over that entire jurisdiction, take over the entire state. That, and the only way he can do that is to send in federal forces. And so the federal forces come in, and they are literally going to go to war in Kansas to try and ensure that it stays pro-slavery. And that's why it becomes known as bleeding Kansas. It's kind of a precursor to the Civil War. We're gonna see what happens. And Pierce is remarkable because he doesn't hesitate to use federal power. This is not a weak president. He's very happy to be strong. He uses every federal power he can find to force slavery down the throats of the people of Kansas. In fact, there's a famous cartoon done at the time that literally shows that. It's kind of a disgusting cartoon, but that's what it shows. Um, and the end result is that Pierce is hated um, in a lot of places uh, because of, he doesn't stand up, he doesn't stand against slavery, um, and he ends up standing up for something that causes him a lot of support elsewhere. Um, and the end result is he's actually, he loses out the nomination of his party to his ambassador, uh, James Buchanan, which is pretty remarkable. It shows you how far Pierce had fallen. And he spends the rest of his life defending what he did, um, which doesn't help either. Um, so Pierce is uh, pilloried everywhere. Even at uh, Bowdoin, where he went to college, they removed his name. And one time there's a debating society name for him. They took his name off the debating society. The law school used to be called Franklin Pierce Law School in New Hampshire. They took that name off too, became the University of New Hampshire. So he's re uh, unremembered <laughs> systematically. Yeah. I think it might be back. Justice Souter teaches at Franklin Pierce Law School, and they're using the name again. So oh, they are. Okay. He's had a resurrection, which is okay. good, good, for, good um, for Franklin Pierce. It's good, it's good for Franklin Pierce. So yeah. We'll see how long that lasts. Right? Exactly. <laughs> right. So there's a dramatic uh, fissure in the book because we jump from Franklin Pierce to Chester Arthur, and we don't have the Civil War and its constitutional legacy. Right. And when we rejoin our lackluster list of presidents with uh, the mutton-chopped uh, President Arthur, the main issue is civil service reform. And he That's seems correct. to actually uh, 
do pretty well on that. He's expected to be a stalwart and to oppose civil service reform, but he surprises everyone by supporting it. Right. He surprises everybody by doing a lot of things. Uh, so Chester Arthur would be a candidate to be the most forgotten president uh, if we simply had a, if we describe what ought to be the characteristics of somebody like that. Chester Arthur's greatest accomplishment before becoming vice president was to be the collector of the port of the city of New York. And he was fired from that for corruption. That's all he'd done before he became vice president. Um, so there are a lot of people who, when he became president, thought, my God, we are dead. I mean, this country's over. Um, and the biggest problem Chester Arthur had, besides what I just described to you, is that the only, the reason why he did anything at all was he was the political lieutenant of a guy named Roscoe Conklin, a very, very powerful politician within the Republican Party. And Arthur's reputation within the party was known as, he was known as Conkling's Creature. <laughs> That's what they called him. So Conkling's Creature becomes President of the United States. The question is, what's he going to do with Conkling? What's he going to do with patronage, which is what Conkling would want? And what's he going to do about this one huge problem that Garfield didn't solve before he died? And that is this problem of patronage and the idea that maybe if we had civil service, we could have people that become expert in government and professional and not just political hacks. And interesting enough, the president that solves that problem is Arthur. He thinks, OK, I'm going to try and do the right thing. And I'm going to back this law. He helps push it through Congress. He signs it into law. It's called the Pendleton Act. And this is the act that is now the foundation for the modern civil service law. Um, and it's Arthur that brings it into being. Did Conklin have a role in the assassination of President Garfield? Uh, Guiteau, the assassin, cried out when he shot Arthur, I am a stalwart. Arthur is president now. Uh, As best we can tell, he, he did not. Uh, so the, the, the stalwarts were a wing of the Republican Party. They called themselves the stalwarts because they, they, their thought was, we are the ones that really are faithful to the basic principles of the party. Um, and Conklin was a stalwart, uh, as was Arthur. Um, Guiteau, who shoots um, Garfield, by all accounts, was insane. Um, and he had been an applicant for federal office because he just had this insane idea that he was qualified and had tried to persuade people to appoint him to different things. They wouldn't because they realized he was crazy. Um, and unfortunately, he kept the idea in his head and eventually shot Garfield, thinking that if he got rid of Garfield, Arthur somehow would appoint him to something. But it wasn't so much that Conklin was Biden or the stalwarts or anybody else. I mean, the best evidence we have is this was an insane individual, and unfortunately, he had a gun. OK, we have uh, two chapters devoted to Grover Cleveland, who, as uh, we all, he's not totally forgotten, because I learned about him in middle school as the veto president, although Absolutely. you tell us that You he, went to a good middle school. <laughs> no, I, I, had, I, I had a great, uh, some great teachers, but there, I remember an old book that showed him signing the vetoes. But you tell us that there were more vetoes in the first term, something like 400, than in the second term, right. 170. What were the different conceptions of his two terms? And tell us about his view of the Constitution and his notion that uh, his job as president was to keep uh, the government within its constitutional right. limits. So, th so what you've just described is how he was the first term. So when Cl Cleveland comes to office the first term, he's very much like Van Buren, but maybe even more so. He, he, he actually would have been a good Whig. His view was the first term. I will, in fact, uh, try and not uh, abuse my powers. I really believe that Congress should um, take the lead on things. And I won't even get involved with Congress, that is to say. I won't get involved with the discussion of legislation, lobbying, or anything like that. So what that left him with was only a couple things. One was trying to make nominations, and the other was vetoes. And the reason he ends up casting so many vetoes is he felt that there was no authority in Congress to give pensions to veterans of the Civil War. Um, and so he kept vetoing those pensions, feeling there was no authority to give that. So it was a very narrow view of what he thought um, Congress should be doing in that regard. Otherwise, he would simply would sign what Congress did. And, and Cleveland also um, had a view that the president should only use the veto power if something was clearly unconstitutional. Well, he just thought these were clearly unconstitutional. So he set a record the first term. The second term, which then f um, didn't directly follow the first, he comes in as a different person. He comes in in the middle of another depression. And now he actually almost takes the completely opposite view of the presidency. 
Now what happens is he thinks, okay, the president's got to be much more energetic. I've got to push things through Congress. He bullies Congress, threatens Congress, tries to get it to do whatever he wants with regard to this depression. Uh, he vetoes some laws, but he's a very different kind of chief executive. In fact, he's the chief executive that Woodrow Wilson will later think is the only significant one in the last 25 years of the 19th century. Wilson thinks and there's nobody else who's significant, but Cleveland was. Uh, and actually what he is, is the first modern president. What changed Cleveland's mind? I think the depression, I think his loss, I think his wife, <laughs> I think all these things sort of come together. And he's of a view when he comes into his second term that we've got to do more to fix things. Um, and I've got particular ideas about what that is. And I think the president is a part of this process. And I think I'll veto less and maybe we'll achieve more if Congress does what I say. You mentioned that he was the first modern president. Is that pre-modern view that you could uh, veto uh, you know, civil war pensions because it's unconstitutional? Could that be even sustainable today in an age of plebiscitary politics? It would be so unpopular. Could a president get away with that kind of view now? Well, it didn't make Cleveland popular, which is one reason why he gets not reelected uh, the first time. Um, and so I think that it becomes harder. Uh, I also think what happens more today, and this is partly what Cleveland somewhat um, attempts to do, just doesn't do well, and that is the presidents start trying to work more with Congress. Uh, people throughout the 19th century are just not sure to what extent presidents and Congress should be working together and battling each other. Um, and Cleveland is slowly moving us toward a view that maybe things would work a little more efficiently if presidents and Congress actually work together. Um, there's, political party does introduce a huge problem in that respect. Um, and, and Cleveland, I think, also simply has a, a problem in that, it, it, problem may not be the right word, he was actually uh, somebody who was incredibly honest. He had tremendous integrity. And he simply didn't believe in bending his principles. He just didn't believe in doing something he thought was either a bad policy or just not a good idea or something that just uh, smacked of him of patronage or something that wasn't good idea. So that made him a little harder to work with than maybe some other presidents. He must not have liked the job so much. In one of the Jeffrey Ward books, there's the story of how the young FDR is taken to meet Cleveland and sits on his knee, and Cleveland puts his hand on his head and says, I have one wish for you, my, my little man, that you may never become president of the United <laughs> States. That didn't work out either. No, it didn't work out. <laughs> right. uh, Harrison, ben, uh, Benjamin Harrison, as you say, the fact that a president's forgotten doesn't mean they're bad, and you note that Henry Adams, who disliked Harrison personally, ranked him among our best presidents, and Adams, of course, was no easy critic. He signed landmark Commerce Clause enactment, the Sherman Antitrust Law. He created the Federal Circuit Courts and the Supreme Court's discretionary control over its docket. And he had four Supreme Court appointments, reshaping the court more than almost any other right. president. Uh, tell us about why he was so influential. Well, you, you certainly have reviewed some of the really salient things he did. Um, so this is remarkable for a man who most people actually personally disliked. Um, and, but it was because he was actually somebody who would try to get laws through that he thought were sort of the right laws to get done. He actually would have weekly meetings with members of Congress, have them over to his house, White House for dinner and stuff, and actually would try and work with Congress to get these laws through. So it, it was almost revolutionary at the time. He's getting a lot of sort of um, what were then pretty progressive laws through, the Sherman Antitrust Act, for example. Um, and the difficulty he's got is he just was such a difficult character. Uh, didn't like people, um, which is a real problem for a president. Um, uh, and so uh, that came through. Um, it also came through with leaders of Congress who hated him. Um, the person that uh, also tries to run against him was his own Secretary of State. Um, so there's a lot, of, um, a lot of problems he's got in a sense that he can't keep his administration uh, together. Uh, at, while at the same time, he's getting a lot through Congress. So he's actually pretty successful, as you just pointed out. He, he ends up reshaping the judiciary, um, creating the foundation, really, for what we think of as the modern judiciary. Um, he's also passed one of the most important laws in American history. Um, he also is there uh, trying to sort of back a pretty robust sense of what the Commerce Clause power is to regulate the economy. All these are pretty progressive things for the era. Uh, it's just that he can't see them through to the end. Taft, 
As you note, soon after he became Chief Justice, which was his lifelong ambition, he told a friend he no longer remembered being president. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, uh, and he had this fascinating notion that, the, as you say, he was the last of the presidents to conceive of the presidency as subservient to Congress and policymaking and thinking of his role as essentially judicial and constitutional. He thought it was his job to keep Congress within its enumerated powers. Tell us about that and why it was so unsuccessful as a presidential vision. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so he had a view, as you just described, of Congress, um, well, uh, of the president as being uh, restricted in its power. But his view also was every branch is restricted in its power. So um, he would stay within his bounds, Congress should stay within its bounds, and of course the judiciary within its, its particular bounds. Um, and Taft, unlike others, was very, very uh, committed to trying to stay within those boundaries. Um, he was somebody who just simply would not um, do anything that he thought was political for the sake of being political. So he didn't like going out and shaking hands. He didn't like giving speeches. He didn't do, like doing a lot of the things that we think of presidents liking to do. Those are going to hurt him politically. Uh, substantively, he's actually going to get a lot done. Um, he'll get a variety of laws through, um, again, broadening more or less the extent to which the federal government is regulating the economy. Uh, so the foundations really sort of are almost modern economic regulations are all being laid at this time. Um, he's going to completely revolutionize, revolutionize the judiciary through six appointments to the Supreme Court, which is remarkable. One term, six appointments. Um, that's incredible. Um, and he's very deliberate about what all those are. One of his deliberations was picking old guys so that he could succeed right. them and become right. Chief Justice. Right. Yeah, exactly. So he said the hardest thing he ever had to do was to pick somebody to be Chief Justice because he's, as he's doing it, he's thinking, that's my job. You know, well, how could I give this to somebody else? So he picks somebody named Edward Douglas White to become Chief Justice. White had been an Associate Justice appointed by Cleveland. Um, and I think a pretty popular person among the other justices. But Taft wasn't stupid. And Taft does note along the way that White was older. Um, so later, when Taft is not president, but Harding is president, um, turns out that uh, White dies. And who's first in line knocking on the door of Harding but Taft, saying, oh, gee, it's too bad. White's dead, but you know, I'm available. Yeah. He cast far fewer vetoes than Roosevelt and actually wrote his vetoes like judicial opinions, saying, I dissent. Give us some more contrast between Taft's view of executive power and Roosevelt's. Yes. Yeah, so Roosevelt was, of course, as the documentary, among other things, would show, is an exuberant personality. You know, somebody who was very much um, uh, committed to trying to do whatever he thought was proper and right as president. So he wasn't constrained by anything. The office didn't, did not constrain him. The Constitution did, did not constrain him. The only thing Roosevelt thought constrained him was whether or not the, pop, the popular vote or the people would support it. If he thought he had popular support, Roosevelt would do it. He'd go that direction. So this is Teddy Roosevelt, um, energetic, accomplished, um, and unbounded, and almost the exact opposite of William Howard Taft. Now, Taft thinks he's completely constrained by law, particularly by the Constitution. Taft also thinks he's not um, somebody like Roosevelt, who had kind of a steward theory of the presidency, which is, I'll just take it wherever I think it ought to go. Taft, views instead, no, I'm going to just simply stay within my bounds like a car, keep it in its lane, and we're going to be very careful about you know, how fast we go and, and where we go. Now let's contrast Taft with Coolidge. Coolidge, of course, inspires the meanest comment in the book. When Dorothy Parker learned of Coolidge's death, she famously said, how could they tell? Uh, but you say that Coolidge conceived of legislative power in ways that resonate more with modern conservatives than did Taft, though Taft's conception of judicial power seems more like that of contemporary Republicans than does Coolidge's. Tell us more about that interesting right. contrast. So Coolidge is, is somebody who, by and large, was a successful president. Um, uh, he didn't ultimately like being president, but that, but, uh, to some extent, is another story. Um, so Coolidge has a very, very well-developed philosophy. Coolidge believes, um, and this is not so much a quote, but it's really a, uh, it's associated with him, the government that governs best governs least. That's basically Coolidge's outlook. He believes that uh, government sort of ought to stand out of the way of business, try and um, 
not so, so he wouldn't support a lot of regulation of business, would actually prefer government to kind of uh, pull back its regulations of business. Um, he believed the federal government had very limited powers over a variety of different things, so he wasn't going to support an intrusive federal government in a lot of different areas of life. Um, so all that is ought to resonate, all that ought to sound very familiar. Um, but even then, uh, Coolidge did believe occasionally the federal government ought to do some things. So he's the first president, for example, to support regulation of broadcasting. He's the first president to support regulation of aviation. Those become very common things. They hadn't happened before, but he does have an idea of the Commerce Clause as providing some degree of congressional regulation of areas, um, even though I think on a lot of things, like let's say a Department of Education, which he would never have envisioned, he wouldn't have supported. So he's, he's very conservative in the sense that he really wants to keep the federal government uh, under budget, he wants to keep the federal government um, sort of limited in what it does, and that's and he tries to be very consistent about all that. But he does, as you know, that this, although he believes the Constitution restricts the power to regulate the economy, he also believes that the power of the federal government includes cultivating the moral right. character of right. Americans. What kind of moral cultivation did he say? You know, you're right, and so he he had a particular view that the government did have a role in trying to shape people's character. Uh, so interesting enough, while he didn't believe in a lot of different kinds of departments, one department he actually proposes to Congress is almost a department of moral education, uh, moral character. Uh, not so much education, but we need to be able to worry about people's character. And he thinks that people's character is integral to the extent to which they can prosper um, under the Constitution, which would allow them to acquire property and keep it. So he sees all of that as integrated. Um, he certainly believes the Constitution protects private property robustly. But why, how do people acquire pro property? Well, if they're good at what they do, and if they're good people, they'll acquire things. And so he's very, he takes a lot of care over the extent to which that can be done. He gives a lot of speeches about the importance of moral character and does see a role for government. But Congress, interestingly enough, of course, d doesn't think that ought to go anywhere. And just so I understand it, is it that moral cultivation that distinguishes his constitutional vision from Taft's, or is there some other difference? No, there, there, there are others. So, so I think with... Um, Coolidge, um, Taft, so you know, the, the contrast between Taft and Coolidge is maybe a, a subtle one. It's not a real uh, dramatic one. But I think what Coolidge does, a little more than Taft, is he actually wants to pull it back even more so, I think, than Taft did. So, for example, Taft actually did support some areas of conservation, the federal government sort of um, enforcing what we might think of as environmental laws, things like that. I think Taft, uh, Coolidge would not have supported that. So there's a lot of areas where Taft thought the government should go that Coolidge would have pulled back on. And then I think there's a second thing. He, he thought government did have a role in cultivating character, which Taft wouldn't have agreed with at all. And then lastly, I think he would have agreed, by and large, with Taft's views on construct, construction. So he would support the idea that um, the courts should be very strongly protective of private property, which, of course, is what Taft believed as well, and also uh, very supportive of a constrained federal government. So in those regards, they had a lot in common. Great. Well, we leap from Coolidge to a far more recent president, and that's Jimmy Carter. And I'll, well, I'll just ask you uh, right away, why, why, why Carter? Yeah, I get in trouble for it. That's why. <laughs> so, okay, that's right. <laughs> I got to get in trouble for something. Most people don't care that much about forgotten presidents, so let's pick somebody people might remember. Um, uh, I think Carter gets, is forgotten for a few different reasons. One of which is, even if people do remember him as president, they don't remember what he did. So that's pretty remarkable for a time period. You know, it's remarkable for a president who pretty much existed and was president when most of us were alive. Um, and so the very fact that he's forgotten for much of what he's done is one reason. Um, I think that a second is that I think he is forgotten in a more objective sense in a lot of different respects. So if you look at history books and other things, he rates really low on the extent to which, he, to which he's mentioned. Remember those criteria we talked about at the beginning? He ends up being really low in a lot of those criteria. Um, and he's also sandwiched between two other presidents who are going to be more remembered, one of which is Ford, who's associated with Nixon, the other of which is Reagan, of course, is well remembered. So all that diminishes Carter, and the more he's diminished, the more likely he's forgotten. You say one of Carter's problems is that his constitutional vision was muddled. He actually was uh, not a supporter of Roe v. Wade. Or, no, was he was very was interesting. He, he, was, he was critical of Roe v. Wade, though maybe not 
um, energetically so. He didn't come out a lot and criticize it, but he didn't personally support it. So therefore, he didn't personally get involved in doing stuff to, to support it. Um, that alienated him from some parts of the Democratic Party as time went on. Um, and it also meant that he was, uh, he had brought into the Democratic Party some people he couldn't keep there. So, so a lot of Christian conservatives actually supported him for president to begin with. But as he was trying to keep their support and maintain his position on road, the Democratic Party itself was moving in a different direction. And that meant ultimately he was going to lose their support. It was fascinating. Uh, an anti roe pro-affirmative action Democrat right. obviously is going to have a challenge maintaining right. his base. Right, exactly right. So he was very much pro-affirmative action, though. Um, so in his presidency, it coincided with a case called Baki. Uh, but he ends up not wanting to sort of go the road, uh, follow Baki. So he tries to take the presidency and say, look, we don't have to really comply with that so much. And he tried to figure out a way for the presidency to support affirmative action. Here's the, I mean, I have so many constitutional questions coming out of this wonderful book, but one of the, the most urgent one I have is, why is it that constitutional debate was so central to all of the early presidencies you describe all the way through Coolidge, where the presidents are making arguments and vetoing bills in constitutional terms, and then that just stops. And even, even Carter's uh, constitutional positions are muddled, and he relies more on the Supreme Court than on his own constitutional vision. Why was that? Why has that happened? It's a great question. I, um, I, I, I can give you a, a, an estimate of an answer. I think it, it, it's hard to know what the right answer is. Um, I think there are probably a few things. I mean, one of them is I think it stops because the media is going to become a much bigger factor in people's lives, particularly presidents' lives. So much of what they're going to do, everything they do, everything they say, is now going to get covered much more copiously. And I think that has caused presidents to be a little more circumspect about what they have to say. Much of what characterizes those earlier presidents is they were less circumspect about what they had to say. Um, they didn't mind sort of calling people on the carpet. They didn't mind being tougher. Or in Taft's case, he would have probably just not wanted to go on TV at all. Um, uh, and in fact, some of these folks probably wouldn't have been elected because they weren't very media. They just wouldn't have come off very well in the media. So I think the 24-7 coverage of it all makes um, circumspection uh, more likely. Um, I, I think a second factor is the very way people become president and get an, nominated by their parties is very different now. So it's much more, um, the parties uh, are, uh, have much fuller sort of vetting of people, much, uh, and, and that also tends to sort of sometimes knock out folks that would have more extreme views. Some of these folks that become president actually do have pretty extreme views early on. But over time, I think what you see is a process that tends to cut out people who have extreme views and more you know, find folks that are closer to the center. So I think those are all factors that play into this. Along with me, our great audience recited our congressional mandate to disseminate information on the Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Right. Uh, so, but, but I do detect a theme in this book, which is that presidents who have adopted a radically limited vision of both presidential and congressional power have failed. I think that's, I think that's true. Um, I think that's also nonpartisan. Um, so I, I think it's true, um, be, again, for a variety of reasons. One is, uh, and maybe one of the most important, is that our system of government, our very, the very Constitution itself, has set up a system in which it, uh, the branches that tend to acquire power are reluctant to give it up. So one thing you can see as a constant throughout American history is as each of the branches gain power, you don't see any of the three branches wanting to give it up. Uh, and so a president that tries to come in and attack that or uh, work against that is going to end up having one or more branches working against him. And not to mention the political party as well. Um, and that becomes a real problem over time. So you don't see presidents, for example, even to this day, saying, well, I'm not going to uh, use all that power some other president acquired before me. Uh, the same thing is true for Congress. If Congress enacts certain kinds of laws, you'll see uh, Congress still trying to uh, work on that page and work forward from that. The, the Supreme Court itself, it may be different. Certain outcomes may be different in different cases. But I don't see the Supreme Court, for example, which has acquired broader and broader judicial review, 
saying, oh, let's give it up and defer more to the other branches. Instead, it continues to use that power. So I think that, the, that basic dynamic that the branches each have to kind of keep what they've acquired works against some of this. Yeah. Could you imagine a constitutionalist president being elected today, as a, a, a President uh, Mike Lee or a President Ted Cruz? Ted Cruz came here and gave a great speech on Constitution Day. C could they be elected, and if so, would they succeed? Um, I think that it's possible they could get elected. I think they would find it very hard to do what they set out to do. Um, and, and part of that, interestingly enough, is because of the Constitution. So the other thing we haven't mentioned, which is probably worth mentioning, is that sometimes to do radical things, even to cut back on things, requires using the institutions that are set up. So if you want to cut back on certain things, let's say, for example, eliminating the Department of Education, you'd have to get that through Congress. And I'm not so confident you'd be able to get that through Congress. Um, you still have things like the filibuster, for example, in the Senate, and you have other things going on in the House. Would that be possible? I think you'd get some things done, but I think what you'd find is moving in any particular direction in an extreme way is very difficult, uh, given the, the very structures we've got that are set up to stop those kinds of um, extreme movements. Great. Well, I think we have time for just, just one question, but it's an excellent uh, one. Um, can you compare Congress's struggle with Tyler with Congress's struggle with Obama? And more broadly, what, how would you advise Obama in his constitutional struggles with Congress in light of Tyler and other <laughs> <Okay>. presidents? <laughs> yeah. And I've got how many minutes? No. Um, well, I, I, think there's, I, I think there is a limited analogy you can draw. Um, Tyler, I think, was unpopular because he wasn't elected in his own right. He'd been a vice president who had become president. But he was already unpopular even before that point because he had essentially dissed both political parties. Um, again, remember, he left the Democratic Party to run with the Whig Harrison. And then when he's the Whig president, he's not really doing what the Whig Party wants. And they actually expel him from the Whig Party. So he's literally a man without a party as he's president. Um, that, that sets up a lot of friction already. I think with, um, with Obama, I think we're in, the friction results from different things. I think the friction, at least in my view, results in part from racism. I think some of it results in part because he's a Democrat and maybe some of the policies in, he's enacted. So that friction, I think, generates from sources that are different than Tyler. And how you then get rid of that friction would be different as well. Tyler could never join a party and therefore get rid of that friction. With Obama, I think, so it gets us to the advice part, what would I advise? I would advise that you still have at least two years left and you need to get out of the office more. I think going up to Capitol Hill and meeting with folks is not a bad idea. I think uh, even if you can't reach deals with them and coordinate with them, putting a spotlight on your attempts to do that would be very effective because either it'll look like people don't want to work with you or they'll try and come up with something. Um, so I would suggest trying to do more openly um, to find common ground with people, whether it's in the House or in the Senate. Um, and of course, he's trying to use the executive orders more, but I think that has a limited utility because it only depends on the extent to which the next president wants to extend them. Um, and it works in the short term. Whether it works in the long term is a harder question. Um, but I think he's got to, and of course, the other thing, which those of you who read the Philadelphia Inquirer would know, um, is I think he's got to tell his story more. I think he's, he's a remarkable speaker. Uh, he hasn't used that gift enough to rally support for things while he's doing, while he's trying to get stuff through Congress and trying to rally Congress to his side. I think that remarkable gift's got to be used more. I can't resist this final question. If it's not up to the president to strictly construe the Constitution to enforce federal uh, limits on federal power, uh, and it's not up to... Congress, does that just leave the courts? No, you still got states. Um, you still have states that could do things. And I think that one thing to consider is what, uh, what uh, initiative states could employ. So if there are not things that the federal government can't do or has limited ability to do, that means it's left to the states. I mean, they really can take a lot of initiative there. I, as you well know, I'm never a fan of having the courts take much of a lead on any of this. Um, I'm not a big fan of, you know, big scope of judicial review, though we do live in an era with that. Um, but I think what uh, also needs to be considered are, you know, what are what, in, in, in innovative ways 
we could deal with things. And I, so I think um, Van Buren tried that. His innovation wasn't very effective. Um, and the other thing to think about is what you want to get done. I, I think um, sometimes to be successful, you have to lower your sights. And so sometimes you can get incremental things through. And sometimes the bolder you are, the less successful you might be because boldness isn't really received very well given the structure of Congress. But maybe finding common ground, different places, you could figure out solutions even within Congress. I'm, I'm going to remain an optimist because I believe in the Constitution like you do. Um, and I, I think that the, you know, the Constitution endures, and so that's, that's a great thing to think about. Think about the different ways it provides opportunities. Uh, not, and of course, we've left out of this whole equation maybe the most important part, and that's the American people. You know, the American people have a lot to say about all this, um, and you know, what do they think the government should be doing? It would be useful to know. Beautiful note on which to end. Michael Garrett, thank you for having resurrected the constitutional legacy of these forgotten presidents and for having written a wonderful book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it enough. Yeah. It is a book signing and book sale, so please come meet uh, Michael Garrett. <laughs>